Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right, uh, seven o'clock. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the April 24th meeting of the Town Council Finance Committee. Uh, is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on anything on tonight's agenda? <clears throat> Seeing no one, uh, we'll move on. Uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to receive a presentation from the school board on the recommended 2019-2020 uh, budget. Um, the school board has held a number of workshops over the last few months, and on April 4th, they voted on the budget that's being presented tonight. Um, Tonight is going to present an opportunity for the members of the town council to ask uh, questions regarding the budget and raise any points of discussion uh, regarding said budget. Uh, tomorrow night, the finance committee will have a wrap up of uh, their budget discussions, followed by a special meeting of the town council to set a public hearing on the 2019-2020 municipal budget uh, with a proposed date of that public hearing of May 6, 2019. After that, at the May 13th, 2019 regular town council meeting, the town council will vote on the fiscal year 2020 municipal budget and uh, the proposed school budget. The school budget validation election is currently scheduled to be held on June 11th. Um, with that, do any members of the town council have any questions or comments before we begin? Okay, seeing none. Um, so tonight's agenda has a single agenda item. Uh, is there someone from the school board that wants to present on that item? Hi. 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 I'm going to start with three of us. So, good evening and welcome to the school board's presentation of the Cape Elizabeth School District's um, FY20 budget. The process of constructing a truly successful school budget is a highly collaborative and organic building project, which asks much of many over a long period of time. In fact, this year, it not only started much earlier, but also included a much larger number of people. As you may recall, at the end of last year's budget cycle, both of the school board and the town council stated a wish to begin a dialogue on how to improve the overall budget process. I'm happy to share with the public that indeed both groups engaged in joint workshops throughout the fall of 2018 that fostered communication and a trusting relationship by exchanging ideas and sharing perspectives. From these workshops, both the town council and school board agreed that forming a subcommittee made up of both chairs and finance chairs, the superintendent, town manager, and business manager would be prudent and beneficial to both groups. To date, this subcommittee has met three times and plans to continue holding meetings on a regular ongoing basis. <clears throat> It is without a doubt that the joint effort by the town council and school board to work together has already had a positive impact and that it will continue to make our town more cohesive and our schools better off. Thank you to all of the town councillors for their time and commitment and an additional thanks to their members of the subcommittee, Matt Sturgis, Jamie Garvin and Chris Straw. Included in the FY20 budget is a proposed needs assessment facility study by Colby Company and Engineers. Much attention was devoted to a similar proposal during last year's budget, but was ultimately removed in part because there was a wish to involve a larger circle of stakeholders. As a result, the school board launched a renewed effort to improve the school's facilities at the beginning of the fall by forming a committee composed of, broad scope, composed of a broad scope of stakeholders. In all, there were over 45 people on the committee. This included the superintendent, town manager, two town councilors, four school board members, three school principals, business manager, the director of facilities and transporta transportation, the director of athletics, the director of nutrition, one school nurse, one music and band teacher, two theater directors, six teachers, five community members, and a total of 11 students from the high school and middle school, two representatives from Colby Company and Engineers, and two representatives from Scott Simons Architects as well as over 16 members of the public in attendance. The committee was charged with gathering sufficient information on structural and safety related concer concerns for all Cape Elizabeth School Department facilities via tours, reports, and first-hand interviews through a total of four different meetings. With the committee's ultimate charge being to determine whether or not they would recommend the school board 
they would recommend to the school board that the cost of a needs assessment study be included in the FY20 budget. During the final needs assessment committee meeting on January 9th, all members voted in favor of recommending the needs assessment in the amount of $189,060 that it be included in the FY20 school budget. During the school board's February 12th regular business meeting, the board voted seven to zero to include the study in the budget. Thank you to all the members of this committee for researching and illuminating the need to, make, to take a much more proactive stance in securing, improving, and revitalizing one of the greatest assets of our town. Again, constructing a successful budget is a collaborative and organic building project. Goals create the vision and a variety of factors serve as the building materials. As Elizabeth will elaborate, the primary factors involved are one, enrollment, enrollment and EPS calculations, two, revenue and state subsidy, and three, salary and benefit costs. Because these factors change from year to year, it is essential that a clear vision and firm objectives serve as the foundation for building the budget. The vision, or our goals, become our compass and keep us pointing north. This year, the school board crafted the following goals for the budget process. One, maintain and improve high quality education for every student. Two, carefully examine each line item by considering and evaluating the success and the effectiveness of expenditures, both past and present, in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. And three, provide a clear and continual communication throughout the budget season so that all stakeholders are kept abreast of considerations and conclusions. I want to thank my fellow school board members for defining these goals and for the time and attention devoted to ensuring that the goals are met and for always keeping all of our students in the forefront of our minds. I want to give a special thanks to Elizabeth Seifries for guiding us through this season with clarity, continuity, and time spent as our finance chair. I also want to thank our new superintendent, Dr. Donna Wolfram, and our administrators for their tireless pursuit of excellence on behalf of the entire district. You have worked the longest and the hardest. Finally, I want to thank the citizens of Cape Elizabeth for supporting our schools and entrusting your children into our hands. So hello everyone. I've been asked to explain the process we use for the development of the FY20 school budget. Um, I've used this some, as a similar process for several years and found it to be effective. Although of course there's always room for improvement and um, already next year that uh, we're, we're uh, planning to address uh, Councillor Straw's request that we add more information about um, class sizes of the high school. So we will be doing that. Um, he also asked that we document the process, so I'm going to share some of the process with you tonight, and I am um, writing everything down, so we do have it on, uh, down on paper and in uh, digital form. <laughs> so in mid-November, administrators were asked to develop their original, what we call the original request budgets. They were asked to analyze the programs and staffing and include in their budget what they needed to maintain effective programs what they wanted to change, and what they needed to do to move the district forward. Part of this process included completing an evaluation form uh, for each program, equipment, or staff request that had been added to the FY19 budget in order to evaluate the effectiveness of the, these additions and make a decision on whether or not to continue that uh, program or staffing. Also, administrators were asked to complete a form for any new requests that they had. Um, uh, and that would be about, again, programming, staffing, equipment, um, anything that knew that they wanted to include in the FY20 uh, budget. And the, uh, they were asked to include an explanation of the need for that item. These original request budgets, evaluation, and request forms were to be submitted to the school business manager before they left for the holiday vacation. And you uh, have in your budget binders those evaluations and the proposals. So you can see uh, what they say. Uh, Catherine then compiled the original request budget. 
uh, throughout the month of January, she and I met with each individual administrator to review their budgets. And you've heard this before, but it truly was line by line, and they can tell you. Uh, we discussed with the administrators what was included in every line. When lines went up, we asked why. When lines went down, we asked why. We transferred items to make sure that they were in the right lines. We talked about what would be deleted or not, and what would be able to happen if things were deleted uh, or if lines were decreased. We looked at enrollment projections for FY20 to determine if the number of positions should be increased or decreased. We discussed the effectiveness of new positions and programs that had been added in the FY19 budget and whether they should continue. We discussed retirements. A one classroom teacher at Pont Cove, a part-time Latin teacher at the high school, a Spanish teacher at the high school, a part-time theater teacher at the high school, and a music teacher at the high school, and resignations that we were aware of, a part-time math teacher at the high school. And we made plans to eliminate or change programs based on those staffing changes. We also discussed building and maintenance needs with building uh, administrators and also with Perry. Uh, with concerns about including enough funding in the budget to provide for the improvements in our buildings that need to be made. Um, in speaking with Peter Esposito, our food service director, we realized that there had been no district uh, funding included for appliance and equipment replacement in the budget um, or repair. So we did add $5,000 for replacements and $2,000 for repairs early on in the budget. There just had never been anything in there for that, and our equipment was getting old. Uh, so as a result of the conversations between administrators, the school business manager, and the superintendent, the original request budget was revised, and on January 29th, at an extended school board budget meeting, administrators presented their original request budgets to the school board with explanations of new programs, positions, or equipment requests, and with highlights of their original requests, FY20 budgets. Um, so when we first started out, uh, without changing anything or looking anything, the budget, the expenditure budget was up uh, 8%. Um, this brought it down to a 7.8% increase um, after those conversations with administrators. So in February, the Town Council and School Board Budget Subcommittee that Suzanne was talking about met to share budget updates and ask questions. The discussion was extremely valuable, and the Town Council and the School Board members left with a better understanding of each other's pro progress in their own development uh, of budgets. Plans were made at that point to enter a combined Town Council uh, School Board Generator project in an effort to provide a cost saving to taxpayers. <coughs> In mid-February, we received the ED279s, our, our state subsidy reports, with the good news that our subsidy had increased uh, from FY19 by over $440,000, including funding for our regionalization effort, which was almost doubled, or was doubled, from last year. Um, and that, if you'll remember, was our um, entering into the Greater Sebago Educational Alliance uh, regionalization project. At Councilor Straw's request, we carefully examined our class sizes and student staff ratios in relation to uh, central programs and services, um, but in, in relation to their percentages and in relation to our district policy. Uh, Cape Elizabeth High School Principal Jeff Shedd provided an in-depth study of student staff ratios of the high school, as well as teacher loads in comparison with our neighboring districts. After the presentation, school board members sent any questions they had regarding the original request budgets to the board chair and the finance chair, who organized the questions and sent them out to the administrators, uh, who were given the opportunity during the February 26th and March 5th budget workshops to provide the answers. Uh, I had never experienced this part of the budget process uh, before in budget development, and I think it worked really well. Um, the, um, the school board got answers to the questions that they had, and it gave the administration time to um, really explain um, the answers to the questions. So that was, I think, that was a really good addition um, on my, uh, in my experience, um, to the budget process. 
So in March, the school board directed administrators to try to cut the budget from 7.8% expenditure increase to a 6% increase over FY19. And this re uh, represented a reduction of about $450,000. So, uh, as you can imagine, sitting in front of my group of administrators saying, okay, we now have, we now have to cut the budget $450,000. So, um, we met and we literally sat in front of three big white charts on my wall. One chart, the chart on the left was titled, Things We Absolutely Have to Keep. And these were items in the budget that were required by state and federal mandates to address student needs or items that administrators thought were absolutely necessary to provide the same level of education as in FY19. The chart in the middle was labeled things we could think about cutting. And the chart on the right was labeled things to cut. So um, as we reviewed proposals that were new to the FY20 budget or even staffing or programs that had existed for a while, we placed items for consideration on the appropriate charts along the, with the amount of funding that was connected with each of those items. Um, and again, we were shooting for $450,000. So we had two meetings, and they were long, hard discussions, but very respectful discussions. Items were placed on charts. Items were changed to different charts. Um, items were moved again and again and again until we felt very comfortable and we had our almost $450,000 um, reduction. Administrators focused on a global view of what was best for the district rather than what they wanted for their particular part department. So I was, I was just so proud of our administrators because they really listened to each other and they really um, were We've been reading about systems thinking, and they truly, um, that, that process was truly an example of systems thinking. So decisions um, that had been made um, were increasing the Pond Cove and Middle School French teacher position to full time in order to better serve our students and provide for better scheduling in both schools. So that was actually an increase. Um, increasing ed techs to provide uh, lunch coverage at Pond Cove so that teachers would have more timing. Um, we changed some things around so we could increase the health instruction at Pond Cove. Um, we were taking advantage of the retirement of our part-time Latin teacher at the high school to meet um, the need for more computer courses at the high school. Um, we close examination of staffing needs due to enrollment resulted in the elimination of a fourth grade position at Pond Cove. Um, there was a retirement at Pond Cove, so no full-time positions uh, were, no full-time teachers were eliminated. Um, there was the elimination of a clerical position and a part-time <coughs> position at the high school. Uh, we have been watching our kindergarten numbers. We're very aware of them. Uh, and it appears that one of the, the, the kindergarten teacher was, that was hired um, for this year because of an unusually large kindergarten class was hired on a one-year contract. So unfortunately, she will not be returning. We probably won't need her, it looks, at this point. It is very heartbreaking to us because she's a great teacher, but we are still watching those kindergarten enrollments very closely, so um, more to come on that. Uh, while we did end up making cuts to equipment and supplies in each of the three schools, administrators agreed that um, they had felt that they, they had made progress in bringing the funding up in those areas. Um, back to about halfway uh, to where they were before the cuts in the FY19 budget. So they, they felt okay at that. Um, at the end of the final budget, budget cutting session, administrators had reduced the FY20 budget to a 6.1% increase over FY19 with the hope that um, we were still waiting at that time for our health insurance um, range or ceiling. Um, we still had 10% uh, for health insurance um, increase, the health benefit increases in our budget. Um, in late March, we received word that um, the, the ceiling would be no higher than 7%, so we were able to, uh, the board directed us to use the decrease to lower the expenditure budget to a 5.9% increase, um, <clears throat> with an impact of an increase of 4.9% on the taxpayers. 
so this information was shared with the town council and the school board budget subcommittee at that point we were back together um, that took place in March and at this meeting the group also began plans for a combined town council uh, school board lease purchase um, project for school buses and equipment um, that we in an effort to save money and we'll be entering into those throughout the process the Cape Elizabeth school board was committed to being transparent by providing the community with documents that were reviewed at each meeting, at least two opportunities to answer, ask and answer questions of budget meetings, and videotaping of all our budget sessions. In addition, I published budget updates after every um, budget meeting, uh, and I've used that communication in the past. Um, I've received many positive comments from community members about those updates. They seem, people seem to really like them. Um, and they, they feel that we really have um, done a good job sharing the budget process. So I hope that you have found those useful as well. Thank you. So I too would like to thank the town council for our positive and productive joint meetings in the fall. Uh, thank you in particular to Town Council Finance Chair Chris Straw for his advice on process and documentation. Um, I have constructed my presentation tonight based specifically on the Town Council members' comments from those meetings and tried really to um, structure our entire process based on those meetings. We, we, really, we really heard people, we want to work collaboratively, we want to communicate effectively. So, um, again, you'll, you'll see why we're really focusing on process. Um, so, was it rigorous? Was it methodical? Was it open and transparent? And does the result meet our goals? My answer to those questions is yes. You will have to decide for yourselves. Um, Susanna has always already, and I'm going to try to manage this PowerPoint at the same time as reading, so be kind to me, and if I'm, I, like, tell me to change it if I forget. And you have a copy. <laughs> and you have a copy in writing in front of you. So, Susanna has already referred to some of the work that has led up to this budget, including the meetings with town council, the needs assessment committee, and the ongoing budget subcommittee. Um, further pre-budget development work includes, um, way back in April of 2018, the school board voted to enter into the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, which is a regional service group that includes Brunswick, Gorham, Scarborough, Portland, South Portland, Westbrook, RSU 5, which includes Freeport and Durham, RSU 14, which is Wyndham Raymond, MSAD 15, Gray New Gloucester, and MSAD 6, which is Bonnie Eagle. The decision was then approved by Cape Elizabeth voters in the fall of 2018. And by joining this collective, we are eligible for additional state incentive revenue, which I believe was around $44,000 this year. And, um, but I think even more powerful is that we're able to realize cost savings uh, for things like um, food purchasing and expand professional development and training opportunities for our staff. Other pre-budget work included um, health insurance information gathering. And although um, at this time we are on, you know, we are, our contracts with our teachers and administrators are, are not open for negotiation, so there is no, um, there's no wiggle room. As far as um, health insurance, we, we found it to be um, really important to, to start the research now. Um, contract negotiations will begin next year because there's one year left on the teachers as well as the administrators contract. So um, during our February business meeting, we had the executive director of the main educational, uh, the MEABT, which is MEA Benefit Trust, her name is Jennifer Kent, um, spoke to us about how they do their rating process, you know, what is the MEABT all about? And included in your handout packet tonight is just one of her handouts. The entire packet from that evening is online with the February, I don't remember the date, but February 2019 business meeting agenda and materials. But if you look, it is the overview of the MEABT rating process, which is a fairly standard rating process for insurance companies. But what, we, what you will notice is that 
there's something different because it is a trust. So first of all, with 68,000 active members and 10,000 retirees, it's a very large um, negotiating group. So the MEABT takes that large negotiating group and negotiates with Anthem. Anthem goes through its standard rating procedure. They negotiate and, and they give MEABT the increased range based on experience of the entire group. Um, if we were on the open market, that would be the end of the story. You get your range, that's it. But because it's a trust, they then um, are able to buy down the rate for its members. And so, um, for instance, um, analysis of our rate increase for this past school year, or this past budget year rather, uh, with MEABT versus open market revealed that, um, so we knew obviously that our rate was 8.76% um, increase in um, health, ex health insurance. Um, if we had been on the open market, it would have been 19.42%. So it was, um, that was interesting to learn. So, nope, I hit the wrong button. See, I knew this was gonna be tough to manage. <laughs> So after that pre-budget work, we moved on to establishing goals, which um, I made sure to read at the beginning of every budget meeting, which we held five, I believe five, maybe six. We had a lot of budget meetings. Um, and, and reiterating those goals helped us keep focus and helped everybody um, watching and in the audience understand this is the focus. I won't reiterate the goals as Susanna already read them. Um, Oh, I did again. <laughs> so beginning the budget workshop. So we had we started with an extended budget workshop right here, um, where we listened to each building principal and department head present his or her budget with descriptions of functions and roles, which I think is really helpful not only for new board members but for the public as well to understand that special education is its own department with its own staffing and um, facilities and transportation separate department with its own staffing. So kind of an understanding of you know everybody's role, who's in charge of this department or this building, um, what they do, um, cost center reviews, which include enrollment and staffing as well as supplies and equipment and needs not addressed, uh, program reviews and new program proposals. These presentations were based on what was called the original request budget, which you already heard about, which is really the beginning of the budget conversation. Uh, you will find those presentation packets in your binder separated by school or, de or department and you will see that each show their section of the master budget at the beginning along with a cost center review and any additional documentation. You'll find program reviews and program proposals have their own section in your binder separate from each department. Um, and you can please note that the needs assessment proposal and um, Colby Company and Scott Simon Engineers full presentation is included with the facilities and transportation section of your binder. Um, I'm going to just keep going. No, we're not ready. Um, so next we started intensive and ongoing question and answer period which started with written questions submitted by school board members. What we had everybody do is send them into myself or Susanna. There were a lot of overlapping questions, so we did some collapsing, collating, and then sent those questions out to the appropriate um, administrators and department heads. And at the suggestion of town councilor Valerie Randall, which I think is fantastic and we need to continue doing this, um, we shared those questions with town council so that everybody could see, you know, what are the kind of questions that the school board is asking at this point? What's going on? Um, discussion and follow-up questions ensued throughout the budget process. And uh, after that point, most of the questions were verbal, so we didn't have more written questions to share with town council. But everything is taped and posted. So given that, the major budget driver on the spending side is staffing and benefits. A particular focus was given to enrollment and staffing. The board is locked into rates of pay and benefits that are periodically negotiated, and the board has some choice in staffing, though not total control. 
and uh, most of the handouts tonight are pulled from your binder because I wanted to pay particular attention to them, but you will see as you go through your, your binder. In the enrollment and staffing tab, uh, we had um, analysis of um, and a deep understanding of the ED-279, which is our state aid estimate based on the essential programs and services funding formula. And um, at this moment, I would like to just pause because I was just reminded again last night by an administrator who has worked in a very a struggling school district with um, difficult funding. And I believe everybody's funding you know, is difficult, but a struggling school district and not at all considered a high-performing school district. And he also has worked in a very high-performing school district. And, um, just a reminder that EPS is the minimum amount to fund a school district at its bare bones level. That it was never, it never will be and never was intended to be a guide for funding high achieving, high performing schools. Um, it's not a target, but it is something that we have to pay attention to and try to leverage as much as possible, but not aspire to. So holding that in mind. Um, as you look in your packet in the um, enrollment and staffing tab, you will see how over the last couple of years, and I can tell you the page in just a second. Um, and staffing. So that this section is the section that I'd say that we spent the most time on. So. Page one in enrollment and staffing shows our enrollment history plus an FY20 projection. And if you jump over to page five, there is a lot of uh, tiny wording, <laughs> but it is staffing by school for FY19 and FY20. And we paid particular attention to this. And then there's another handout that shows um, what percentage we are above EPS. And we are above EPS in most, if not all, areas, and um, unapologetically so. So another, in this discussion, uh, you know, after we really had a, a primer around EPS and the ED-279 from business manager Catherine Messmer, uh, we, we wanted to touch back to our own um, school board class size and teacher load policy because that policy is really what should be guiding our decisions. So if you look in your packet, our current class size and teacher load policy is included for you tonight. <coughs> in the handouts. In the handouts. There are two packets still. So. In the handout packet. Um, <coughs> We talk about class size as well as teacher load because at the younger end of the spectrum, it's really about classroom teachers um, and students aren't changing classrooms for, uh, for their, their subject areas except for allied arts, really. As you move on into middle school, there's a little bit more movement and the middle school um, administrators start to pay more attention to teacher load. And then at the high school, it becomes really, really important to focus on teacher load overall versus just your class size. So um, I would like to thank Principal Jeff Shedd for giving us a really wonderful analysis not only of um, teacher load and um, you know, comparing you know, what, what we would look like if we adhered strictly to um, EPS philosophy but also an analysis of our um, student to teacher ratio versus um, peer districts, not just in the state of Maine, but in northern New England, which was useful. We found ourselves to be right in, in the range. We are, we're not an outlier in, in any way. <laughs> so, I'm gonna try to do this. There we go. Um, we looked a lot at enrollment and, real, and wanted to really understand that enrollment is not just a number that you, that you take and divide by a number of teachers and then that just becomes, okay, that's our, that's our student teacher ratio, that's how we staff our buildings. Um, student needs really drive staffing. And um, 
beyond just our choices around how to take care of student needs, we have mandates. And mandates are laws that require programs and services for students. We do not have choices around staffing for those. Many or most of those mandates are unfunded. And around the table tonight, I have shared this poster. And it is not a leaflet because it is so big, I could only call it a poster. This is a compilation of only federal mandates, not main state mandates, but just federal. Starting in the 19, at 1900 and going through, I'd say mid to late 2000s. And different town councilors have this, and I think it's kind of a visually stunning thing to look at. Um, Councillor Straw has one down on that end, and I believe um, Councillor Garvin has one. So, the reason we bring this up is that for many years there has been um, a question of if your enrollment is flat or declining, why is your staffing flat or increasing? And the answer is student need, and it's not necessarily a choice. We are mandated by law to have staffing and programming and services and facility space to meet the needs of our students based on mandates. So if you flip to page four of your handout, handout packet, you will see implication of federal mandates and programs on staffing in Cape Elizabeth schools. If you go back, you know, we can even, each of us went to school at different times. We, we all have different experiences. And we can talk about in my day, they didn't have this or they didn't have that. Um, I was fortunate to be in school in a time where Title IX had already taken hold pretty well. Um, my mother was not so lucky. Some of you might have not been so lucky. Um, special education law, IDEA, you know, was not in effect at when this poster, you know, shows the start. So, I mean, that's just, those are just two very big impactful examples of um, programming and services that we need to provide. Um, and what we need to also remember, again, I'm going to say it, is that mandates impact staffing as well as services. I mean, uh, staffing as well as facilities. So, Many of these services um, will say maybe a speech therapist, speech pathologist, a student that, that is um, found to need these services and we are legally required to have a licensed professional teacher and not just a classroom teacher but a licensed professional uh, clinical person to provide those services. They also need to provide them in a manner that is um, sensitive to privacy that is, you know, that, that allows for the work to happen. So again, finding space for that clinician. We, you know, you need to have space for a um, occupational therapist and possibly a physical therapist. Um, there are just lots and lots of, you know, there are just different people in our buildings than there used to be even 10 to 20 years ago. So the last, um, the last discussion around enrollment and staffing really comes to our community history and, con and continued expectation of high performing schools. And that equals a beyond bare bones program and services to offer to our students. So, um, you've already heard, um, print, uh, Dr. Wolfram talked about at a, at a point early enough in the process to allow for thoughtful work, uh, the board directed the superintendent to reduce spending. Um, although right around that same time we had found out that we were getting um, an increase in our, in our state aid, we still felt that the original request budget with a 7.8% 7, 7 um, expenditure increase was too high and uh, we asked her to try to bring it down to 6%. Um, 
Again, you've already heard that we did receive a state aid, and it's an estimate. I like to remind people of that. It, this is not set in stone. Um, things are, are still in the works at the state level, so our estimate is around $407,000. Um, that could go up, that could go down. We don't know, but that is our estimate at this time. Um, and there, it should be rem you know, remembered that we've had three straight years previously of reductions that are cumulative. You don't receive a reduction and then get pulled back up. Your reduction becomes your new normal. So in FY17, if you'll recall, we had a, a cut of $730,000 in state aid. In FY18, we had a cut of $527,000 $527, in state aid. And in FY19, our cut was actually $899,900. I mean, it was so close to $900,000. Um, so this, this increase this year, was great news, and but it did not bring us back up to the level where we had been previously or any other year in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, however, it did allow us to finally make some progress. So as you have already heard, the superintendent delivered the revised budget with a 6.09 spending increase, which, we, which equated to about a 5.1 tax increase. Uh, the board reviewed the reduction in spending, which included cost-saving collaborations, which you've already heard about, um, including the coordinating generator projects for um, Pong Cove in the middle school and Thomas Memorial Library. Um, it, to date, it includes a lease purchase agreement for a bus and front loader, um, which is estimated to possibly save the taxpayers upwards of $220,000, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, among other reductions um, were proposed such as, you know, uh, reducing current staff, um, deferment or scaling down of certain facilities projects, those sorts of things. Um, in your packet, on the, I believe it's the, the final page of the packet, and of packet six of six, um, this list is included in your budget binder, but it's, it's on the back side of a page, and I always think people might miss back sides of pages. So this was brought to the board, and um, discussed carefully. As you heard from Superintendent Wolfram, there were additions as well as reductions. Um, one thing that I want to bring up is that not only at the board level, but at the, um, the budget subcommittee level, there's been a lot of discussion around the district website. And um, it, it was made clear to us through countless conversations with current community members, current parents, and prospective community members and parents that our website is, is lacking. Difficult to navigate, hard to find meeting agendas, materials, and so um, an important way of communicating with our own community and with, with the greater community in the world is our website. So we did um, choose to add that into the budget. However, with the reductions in cost savings, um, Dr. Wolfram and the administrative team were able to get very close to meeting that goal. And then, happily, we got the great news about our health insurance increase being lower than expected. Um, budgeting at a 10% and crossing our fingers, uh, we were happy to hear that the range was capped at 7%. We all did a little dance. And um, we took the health insurance cost savings, we took about half of it to further reduce the expenditure budget, budget to 5.9% with an attendant tax increase of 4.9%. <coughs> the other half, roughly, I'm gonna see, I think it was around 50, $57,000, we chose to put into our contingency line, um, given that we had heard that at least five, if I, can, I think it was five students identified or their parents identified them as um, 
English as a second language, so non, you know, uh, so English language learners would be coming into Pong Cove in the fall. That caused us to wonder, okay, is there's a large possibility that what we might need to hire or expand our English language learner uh, teaching position. But without ha an, an ability to screen those students till later in the year, we won't know the extent of their need. So it, it seemed prudent along with you know the possibility of the kindergarten unknown to expand contingency. Um, whatever funds not dispersed from contingency or any other line roll into unassigned funds and are typically used to lower tax impact for next year's budget. Um, what I would like to say is some, there have been a lot of really interesting moments in budget subcommittee and one of the things that we did learn is that uh, the unassigned fund balance in the school budget is different from the unassigned fund and the town budget. On the school side, um, the unassigned funds are not allowed to be used. Once our expenditure budget is approved, that is what we can spend. Other, you know, there there's some legal legal. Um, we're allowed to spend. Pardon. Federal funding. Federal funding grants are outside of that, but for the most part, it's you know what you, what you're approved to spend is what you can spend, and so you can't you know if you have funds that accrue in your unassigned fund balance, you can't just reach in there. At the end of your fiscal year, those funds can be used once to lower your tax impact for the next budget. But that's it. You can't you can't dip in. So I thought that was interesting, and I thought that might have been a, something that school board and town council kind of didn't understand about each other's budgets. So. At that point, we were pretty close to the end of our process. We had done a really careful and close consideration of enrollment, of staffing, um, which was our biggest budget driver. We had looked really carefully at um, what was included and what was not included in the budget. And we felt good about bringing our budget for adoption at our April business meeting. So we began our conversation with goals and um, I, I'm going to end our conversation with goals. So I believe that goal one, high quality education maintain, was maintained and improved. Uh, this budget continues and improves upon successful pro programs and services. It shows a commitment to mental and physical health and wellness for all students. It has relevant curriculum updates and additions such as computer programming. It supports the needs of teachers, for example, adding additional planning time for those that were lacking. It includes a much needed update to the website. It includes the needs assessment, which has been deferred. <coughs> it includes facilities projects, such as the Ponco Middle School Generator, which has been deferred, I can't even tell you how many years. It shows up in the budget. It showed up in that, uh, the, ten, the 10 year CIP. I'm sure it showed up in that at some point. Um, deferred and deferred and deferred, and um, which has great benefit to not just the school department but the town as a whole, considering the um, library and town hall get their internet through the Ponco Middle School building. So if that building goes down, everybody goes down. Um, and um, administrators and department has worked as true as a true team to meet the needs of the system as a whole. And when that happens, there's a great benefit to all teachers and students because it's an atmosphere of teamwork. We're all in this together. Every student is our student, not mine and my building, but ours. So we can skip the next one because it's a duplicate. And so goal two was careful examination of the line items in consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. That was met. One example is there was careful study of enrollment that demanded that we absorb some retirements and not renew a one-year contract for an excellent elementary teacher. As, as wonderful as this person has been, the enrollment just doesn't support keeping her on. Hard choices were made. 
um, expenditure increase of 5.9% with a tax increase of 4.9%. If you look back, uh, the average tax increase of the three prior years is 4.8%. The combined town and school tax increase is estimated roughly at 3.9%. I got that wrong. I checked with Matt before you all got here, but didn't have time to fix it. Five sounds like nine when you're just talking really quickly. But that's a pretty exciting thing to hear too for our taxpayers that the town side and school side combined is uh, roughly 3.9% tax increase. And finally, goal three clear and continual communication. This is one thing that I feel particularly proud of because I find myself um, a, I call myself an unconventional finance chair. My background is not in finance or business or anything like that. I, I, uh, I, I focus on process and communication. And I think I had a fantastic leader and partner in Dr. Wolfram because she came in ready to do that and, and planning to do that ahead of time. So number one, we solicited and welcomed citizen questions and comments at every meeting, at the beginning and at the end. We posted all meetings, agendas and materials on the website and on Facebook, uh, live broadcast and post, or videotape and post of all budget meetings. We had thorough and timely recaps of every budget meeting sent via email, posted on the website and Facebook. Regular budget updates were submitted to the Cape Courier, and regular communication and collaboration among the school department, school board, and with the town manager and town council. So that is the end of our presentation tonight, and we welcome your questions. If we can't, if we don't have the information to answer a question for you tonight, we will take it down, do the research, get right back to you, but we'll answer what we can right now. That, uh, thank you very much for that presentation, and uh, Councillor Jordan. Um, this is probably an unconventional way to ask questions, but first I want to say that this is probably the most clear school budget I have experienced, and I, I really appreciate it because as I read through it, I, ha I always have in my mind uh, things that are important to me in, uh, in our school system, and I hadn't read all your goals, and it came through loud and clear for me that uh, quality of education and really the social and emotional health of the students is important. Um, and that's going to eventually lead me to one of my questions. Um, also, it came through the uh, fiscal responsibility and how, how um, I would say, how, how you took that and, and you really represented it so clearly in this budget as to where you had to make those hard decisions. Because I did have the question of, why did we lose a fourth grade teacher? And you explained that to me, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing is is that I, I always think about also the treatment of uh, our employees, and I think that's also represented in here. So I have two questions. One of them is on page, uh, the page five that you were at under enrollment. Page five of enrollment. Yeah. And uh, yes, so so I see I, as I read through this one, and I looked at the uh, ed tech increase, uh, and I see a number six. Am I reading this correctly? Um, five of five. There's six additions of uh, the ed techs. Is it regular instruction? Edtech? Yes. Is that, am I reading it correctly? Because it didn't, and when I saw that, I go, that didn't come through up to this point. And I guess my question is, it, it, it is spread across, but there must have been an intention. I noticed that as... So I can, I can and I'm not sure about the number, and I don't see Jason here tonight, but uh, some of those would be in the... Uh, the lunch aids that we're okay. carrying at Palm Cove. So two of those will be lunch aids at the Palm Cove um, to help 
appropriately cover lunch and allow teachers to have um, the appropriate amount of planning time that they need. Okay. But. Oh, I know. One, one supplier for. Oh, oh, right. We had. So there's a mandated. <coughs> Okay. Through the 504 plan, we needed to add a, um, a tech for a student. Okay. That gets us to three. <laughs> I, I, I believe in the line item of the budget, it's four cafeteria ed techs is what's listed. So that brings you to five of the six. Oh, is it four? But then we brought, they're not full time. But that's so, yeah, but that's so. So maybe that's there. what it is, since it's four, they're four positions, yeah. but they're not full time? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So where's the six? Yeah, but Elizabeth, isn't this before we decided? Because originally, uh, GC yeah, had what's four, the and then we went to two. Yeah, so this, this, this also is the four number. Right, this is also dated to 13, 2019, so this, is, this would be before reductions. Okay, okay. My other question is probably more of a, um, it appears that philosophy has, has shifted as I looked at where, how social work um, uh, positions had been reallocated to um, kind of schools versus um, moved out of special ed, was that my understanding? I think that's fantastic. I thought that was a great, and that told me a story as to uh, the importance of the uh, social and emotional well-being of the kids in the schools. Is there a philosophical shift happening? So I'll, I'll answer and then you'll answer too because you, you have, uh, so I have kind of a historical perspective and then Dr. Wolfram has the fresh eyes perspective. Um, so individualized education plans, which are the, the legal documents for students with, in special ed, a lot of times will include time with a social worker. And um, for a long time, the students with IEPs more than used up the available time for a social worker in especially the middle school building. And there really was a need for a non-special ed specific social worker. Um, that was a decision that was made last year and added into the budget. You'll see it in the um, program review. And I believe there has not necessarily been a philosophical shift, but a growing awareness and commitment mm -hmm. to mental health for all. Um, the middle school in particular has been spearheading an um, initiative year long that has been fantastic. In conjunction with the social workers and the school nurse, there, there have been wonderful opportunities to try to work on um, uh, getting rid of stigma and, and realizing that everybody is struggling with something. And, uh, and just just kind of really getting it out there that you will be heard, you will be found, you will be seen at the school, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it, I feel really proud of that, that we have, not necessarily, I, I don't know that it's a philosophical shift, but it's an awakening. Maybe it's a, it becomes, it's more apparent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's exactly what needs to happen. Uh, because as we look at uh, the world out there today and the pressures on the students. So as I read this, this budget, my whole thing was, are we impacting all students to the same degree from an educational and a social and emotional perspective? And I think it is represented here, so thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Garvin. Thanks, Chris. Um, I first want to thank you for the presentation. Um, also uh, echo the comments and, and sentiments that you expressed about um, the dynamic um, in, in going through the whole process. I think it's been um, highly productive and uh, frankly uh, has been a pleasure to be a part of. Um, I know from all of your meetings that I attended, uh, as well as the subcommittee meetings that we've had, um, 
there have been numerous, uh, you know, times where, as you've been presenting information and discussing things, uh, whether amongst the whole board or amongst our subcommittee, um, there's been uh, very specific and overt um, acknowledgement and, and thoughtfulness to what is the impact to the taxpayer, um, you know, with the decisions that are being made. So I heard and saw that consistently throughout, and I, I uh, you know, I, I think that's. Um, you know, great that you balanced that with, um, you know, what, what program needs you had and things like that. I'm actually um, curious, um, given that we have almost no public um, <laughs> in attendance here tonight, and I know we'll have our, you know, our full budget hearing in a couple of weeks, but have you had much impact, input from the public this year? Because I know that in past years we've gotten a lot more, um, you know, emails or um, you know, communication from the public leading up to these types of meetings, and, and I've actually been kind of surprised that there hasn't been that much this year. So, I have one phone call, <laughs> <laughs> and and I think maybe it speaks to Donna the you know the good quality and transparent information that you've been disseminating. So maybe people don't have as many questions because of how easily um, you know uh, it's been for them to find the information based on your, how you're communicating it, but. Um, I just I, I find that interesting, and I, I was expecting more people to be here tonight, and I'm a bit surprised that there aren't. So um, that was um, you know one primary question I had. Um, the other thing uh, that I was going to point out and, and really commend Matt for and Donna specifically um, is the uh, collaborative nature in which you both have worked um, towards identifying areas uh, and projects specifically, uh, be it generator or equipment purchase lease agreements, things like that, that um, also, you know, have a much larger and wider benefit to the whole town. So um, I know that we were in one of our subcommittee meetings looking backwards at some purchases that were made last year that we would have benefited from that um, and the fact that we're doing that or, or it's being recommended to do that this year, um, again, I think, I, I think is... Um, uh, something good to see and, and I know we'll see more of going forward so thank you both for that so that's all I had any other town councilors going once going twice <laughs> all right uh, in that case then I'll simply note that uh, the uh, finance committee we're going to be hopefully wrapping up our discussions tomorrow evening um, and with that um, motion to adjourn so moved. So moved. All right. Uh, second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Any opposed? I'm seeing none. That's it. We're done. Thank you.